Hello everyone, I have now started up my own events company where I'll be bringing guests from all over the world for a live interview, meet and greet and questions from the audience. My first guest will be undefeated boxer Joe Kozagi. Tickets are on sale now for the event in Glasgow on the 29th of January 2022. You can click the link in the description or go on to Eventbrite Type in Jokel's Aggie Glasgow and purchase your tickets there. I will hopefully see you all soon for what's going to be an amazing night. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. <laughs> Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got David Curtin. How are you, bro? I'm really good, eh? Good to be here. Is that Cheers. how you pronounce your second name? Curtin, yeah. yeah. Like, people get confused with something you put over the window, but it's not uh -huh. spelled like that, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. All over social media, you're all for free speech. Yeah. Absolutely. You just ran for London Mayor there. I did, yeah, yeah. That was last month, and um, disappointing result, you know, but I gave everything I could to it, and uh, I was on the London Assembly for five years, so uh, I'd hoped, you know, we could build on that, and I could become mayor, and we need we need someone to sort London out, don't we? Yeah. I mean, as yeah. well as the rest of the country and the rest of the world, it seems <laughs> yeah. now, but, you know, London's uh -huh. just got absolutely crazy over the last five years, and all this kind of wokery, this political correctness, and as well as like traffic chaos, you know, the, at every level, London needs oh. sorting out. But, you know, it was very disappointing, the results, and uh, the old uh, Sadiq Khan got back in again. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. I don't know how, but uh, he did. <laughs> you know, I was going around campaigning, and honestly, I didn't meet anybody, not anybody who was going to vote for him, not even uh, Muslim people that I spoke to who are running businesses because they say, he's not done anything for us, you know, he's uh, put all these road blockages in. They didn't like him either, you know. So I think there's a lot of corruption in that kind of side of things. In the politics, yeah, there there is, you know, and the the way it's done in this country is is you know people sort of give a contract to their mate or you know a friend's brother or yeah. their wife's brother-in-law or something like this, and so you know it's done in a way that is very difficult to um, see what's going on. You know, I lived in Africa for a couple of years um, back in when I was a younger man, and there it's a bit more obvious. You know, <laughs> the the president buys himself a, a castle, and you know builds himself a big house in the countryside but it's, oh. it's a little bit more subtle here yeah. but yeah i think there is definitely some corruption going on it all needs to come out you know and these people need to be um dealt with you know yeah. they need to go before the courts can't yeah. have that going on we'll touch on all that later mm. in interview, brother, but mm. let's get a better understanding of you where okay. you grew up and how it all began yeah, well, okay, I was born in Sussex. I grew up in a village called Barnum, which is near Bognor Regis. I uh, went to school there. Um, I grew up with my mum. My mum's English. My dad was Jamaican. Uh, but he left before I was born, so I never met my dad. So I'm pretty much, you know, brought up uh, as an Englishman. You know, my mum, she was she's white, she's from Surrey, and uh, a couple of my grandparents as well. We lived in a house together there down in, in Sussex. So I went to school, you know, pretty normal. Um, then I went to university in St Andrews, uh, Scotland, same place as William and Kate went, you know, he's famous for that, but that, I was I was there first. <laughs> I was there 10 years before them. And um, yeah, so I did chemistry there and I, I got a degree in chemistry. Uh, so after then, uh, yeah, I, I did a master's as well. But uh, from then, the main bit of my life working was as a chemistry teacher. So I went back in and, and I taught in a variety of schools in this country and abroad as well, you know, mainly up to a level ib diploma level and uh no, i enjoyed it i enjoyed it. especially i enjoyed um you know using my my job and my career to do a bit of traveling so mm -hmm. you know i didn't just teach in this country i did and around london for quite a lot of time but i taught also in botswana for two years and uh bosnia herzegovina for a couple of years the usa for two years and uh i did a sort of year's maternity cover in bermuda as well so that was quite a good uh, a good gig to get so so, uh, yeah, so that that's um, what I, I spent most of my career on and uh, and before I got into politics. And yeah, how does and, one go from uh, 
teach her to get in politics? I, it just happened, you know? I mean, the thing is for me, politics and current affairs and culture is always something that's interested me. You know, I've always been interested in, you know, news and politics and what's going on and, and where things are going. And um, I, I, you know, maybe held some kind of thought or dream maybe that I could get involved in it sometime. But there came a point I just thought, I've got to get involved. So... I joined UKIP in 2012 and I joined it for two reasons and one is because I was concerned about the EU and where that was going you know so obviously that was uh, the time before the referendum that happened so that was a big thing and I was always very concerned about the political correctness you know which was growing even then you know 10 years ago but you know what it is today it's turned into a beast so yeah. the only party that seemed to be dealing with both of those things was UKIP so I joined and uh, I was really great to be there in the, in the great days of UKIP you know those sort of four years from 2012 to 2016 leading up to the the referendum and uh, so so it was great to be there and be part of it all there yeah. and um, so I first stood for election in 2015 um, I stood in just a very, very difficult seat in inner London, mm -hmm. Camberwell and Peckham. Um, yeah, nice though it is. I was standing against Harriet Harman. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. So yes, the queen of political correctness, really. Mm -hmm. So there was a massive difference between me and her. Um, but uh, yeah, that was my first seat. Obviously, it's one of Labour's safest seats in the country. So uh, it, was, it was very difficult to, to win that one. Obviously, they, they won that. But um, it was good experience. And then the next year, uh, I went for the London Assembly elections and I was second on the list and uh, UKIP got two seats. So I, I got into the London Assembly, um, which is fantastic. So, you know, one of the few people that got elected uh, for UKIP back in the day there. So um, it was great. And I've, I've tried to use it just to bring a bit of common sense and sanity and, you know, ask the questions that need to be asked and no one else is going to do. So um, we got an extra year in the London Assembly because of the whole COVID situation, which is another crazy thing too. But yeah. uh, so I was there for five years, um, uh, which brings us, uh, you know, nearly up to today because, you know, was, uh, we had the elections mm -hmm. um, and, and unfortunately I didn't get back on uh, the assembly. But it was a it was a great five years. And, you know, there's a there's a lot of things there that are hopefully I've done that draw attention to, you know, the the insanity of what's going on. And, you know, if I can bring some hope and courage to people to speak up yourselves when you see something is crazy and, you know, something needs to be changed, you know, people have got to stand up and speak up. Otherwise, you know, the craziness is just going to go on and win. We got to we got to stand up against yeah. it and, and fight back. So, so that's what I've been doing. What yeah. do you think if you became mayor of London, what would you change? I change stuff on every level. I mean, what the three things that I fought the the campaign on was make London safe again, and that was to deal with the police. You know, stop them from doing this politically correct rubbish and two tier policing. Get them out doing their proper jobs. I mean, the police are there to catch murderers and rapists and burglars and thieves and fraudsters. That's what they should be doing. There should be no question that yeah, you know, when we're not going to look into burglary because that's low priority. You know, catch real criminals, but don't do all of this political, you, you know, um, woke nonsense. You know, don't don't be sort of you know, dancing around in rainbows and taking a knee to Black Lives Matter and all that kind of stuff, which is what they've been doing uh, with increasing frequency over the last um, few years. I mean, the, so that's one thing. The other thing is to um, unblock the roads. Because, you know, what's been happening in London under Sadiq Khan is that there's all these bicycle lanes going in. And nothing against bicycles, but when you put them in to narrow the road space for cars, it's causing crazy congestion everywhere. And there's all these road blockages going in under the, the, the green scheme. You know, I don't know if you have them all around the country, but in London it's a big issue, these things called low traffic neighbourhoods, where because of the green ideology, people are just against cars. They want to stop cars from being on the road. So they're putting blockages up at the 
entrances to all kinds of neighbourhoods so vehicles can't travel from one place to another where they could before. So they all need to be got rid of. But unfortunately now, uh, the way it is, we're probably going to have more of them. So I was dead against them. Uh, and the other thing was to open the businesses again. And that comes down to the whole COVID situation. You know, the, this affects London, uh, affects everywhere. But, you know, I think London is really badly affected because of all the the theatres and the, the the cultural things the nightlife the what they call the nighttime economy is just dead it's been killed by all these restrictions you know just just recently people have been allowed to go to the pub again um but you know theatres and cinemas and clubs and music venues they're still closed and all of the extra businesses that that serve them and uh, you know rely on them to to survive. I mean, yeah. what's going? What's happened to them? That they haven't got any business, yeah. so they've gone under. I mean, Sad. the whole thing is absolutely insane to me. Yeah. So I mean, I've my got you know, many got to DJ sort out. friends, um, mm. DJ Fat Tony, uh, Hannah wants, mm. um, but Royal Ascot just had a big meeting there, mm. but yet they can't open theatres they can't open mm. nightlife it's nuts why do you think mm. that is i think there's there's different people who are you know motivated by different things who are in the government who are, who are making this happen i mean i think there are some people who genuinely think that they're saving lives but you know i mean they're they're they lost the plot really i mean they're not you know you've got um total mortality is below the five-year average now and it has been since february so the death rate is below normal there is there is no sort of you know, the bodies aren't piling up like johnson said it's not happening um but you know i think some people are motivated by money and greed you know it's the corruption we talked about before you know they've got uh uh interests in companies that produce PPE and um, links to vaccine companies that are manufacturing these things and you know they they're in for a bit of a dividend some of them I think definitely that's their motivation I think there's others that are motivated by wanting complete control and you, you know there there's you know, this is not a secret that the World Economic Forum talks about the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And um, you have all the world leaders all over. They're all talking about build back better. What does that mean? You know, it means destroying a lot of what's there, destroying what we have now and building it back in a different way. But it's not a way which they've asked people uh, do you want this? I mean, they're not going to us and saying, would you like uh, to have vaccine passports? Would you like digital identity? Would you like us to get rid of cash? You know, would you like to be, uh, have all your children vaccinated with experimental uh, drugs? I mean, they're not, they're not sort of giving you the option. It's like, right, we're going to destroy everything and then offer you this as the solution. And if you don't take it, uh, you're going to keep being punished and locked down. You know, this is what we've seen this week. You know, excuse me, it does make me angry. You know, it really makes me angry that, you know, they, they've given people this hope for the for months and months and months. You're going to unlock a little bit and a little bit and a little bit more. And then on June the 21st, you know, we're going to unlock the country. Everything will be back to normal. And just a week before they say, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to keep it. You're going to keep you locked down for another four weeks. And now they're, or even now before that's happened, they're propagandizing and, and uh, coming up with the next thing. Oh, there's a, there's maybe a vaccine shortage. So we might have to keep you locked down a little bit longer. You know, this is, there's no reason for this whatsoever. So I think there are some, you know, I hate to say this, some, some very, very wicked people who have got very, very wicked motivations and they are destroying our country. And, you know, this is not just here, but other places around the world. You know, you see yeah. it in Canada, New Zealand, you, you know, certain states in the USA. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's never appalling. ending, but the power mm. of the people is so strong. Mm. The power of the people stand up, mm -hmm. then the game for the wicked is over. Mm. Now, this is a scary thing because now what a new virus from India, because what happens is they know how I've never seen this in my lifetime. I don't think, obviously, mm. when you had World War One, World War Two, people were fighting, dying, killing mm. each other for power, whatever. But to then fill the world with fear mm. and people have accepted that mm. you think this is going to be the only time this is going to happen now mm. of course not until people make a stand what i was told is if they if they stop lockdown 
They then can't give a vaccine out mm. anymore. So they've got to keep lockdown going. Why? Yeah. How can you give a vaccine to something that doesn't exist anymore? Yeah. So they'll squeeze and squeeze and squeeze mm -hmm. until people are broken. Now, lockdown is over. People can walk about. Yeah. But the streets are empty. Why? Because people are in the house full of mm -hmm. fear. Mm -hmm. I don't wear a mask. I'm fit, healthy, mm -hmm. young man. I have to right. explain myself every mm -hmm. shop every taxi, mm -hmm. everything. I know a lot of people won't like it because the more, majority of the people follow the rules of what they see on TV, follow the rules of what they read in the newspaper. But I'm a fit young man. I'm healthy. 99%, 99.9% survival rate for anyone under 60. Why are you giving me shit? You've had your two vaccines. You're wearing your mask. Why are you worried then? Shouldn't you be covered? Shouldn't you be fucking okay then? That's right, that, yeah. Like people, it scares me that how people can be so dumbed down. Now listen, I could be wrong. Mm. I could be fucking wrong. I could be mm. just as loopy conspiracy theorist, just looks into everything differently. I also think, well, maybe the, the government do look after us. Mm. Maybe they do are concerned. But really, suicide's through the roof. Drug abuse is through the roof. More people are dying by these two, by mm -hmm. single-handedly from suicide. The numbers have just come through that they've nearly trebled. Alcohol abuse, drug abuse, people losing their businesses, losing their jobs. For why? Because someone says on the TV that this is what's going to happen. If you don't, if you don't obey by these rules, then you lose your fucking life. People are losing their lives anyway. Mm. So why not take a chance and make a stand? Mm. It's so fucked up. How yeah. do you, when you go against the grain, speaking yeah. out like this, do you become a threat? Do you ever worry for your life? I haven't worried for my life, but you know, I, I'm not worried. You know, if something happens to me, it happens to me. You know, wh what is that? I mean, I've just got to do it anyway. You know, you can't worry about these things. You know, so what, someone might bump me off. I mean, who knows? The president of Tanzania, you know, he got bumped off, didn't he? He was against it and he was speaking up. He was a great man, wasn't it? John John Makafuli, I think his name is. And he he was the one who actually sent these um, uh, samples of goats and papaya to the, the lab and they came back positive for COVID and he just made a complete fool out of the World Health Organization. But yeah, he was disappeared for a couple of weeks and then it was reported he, he's dead. Um, shocking, shocking, isn't it? But, you know you got to fight for it. you yeah. got to stand up for what's right, you know, not worry about these things. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not, but it's, um, yeah, I don't wear a mask. Um, you know, you can say you're exempt, but you know, I've had hassle for that. And, uh, I had a very disturbing experience on a train up to the Midlands a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I, I just decided I'm going to try and see what happens. I'm just, someone came along and, uh, you know, this woman inspector and she, she asked if I w was wearing a mask and I just thought, I'm not going to say anything. You know, I've got the right to silence. And um, so then she said, are you exempt? And I didn't say anything. And she got quite agitated. And do you know what she did? She started doing this with her hand in front of my face, like and to, to try to get me to say something. And I just said, I thought, well, I'm just going to see what, see what happens. So then she started tapping me like this on the shoulder. And she started tapping. She knocked my phone out of my hand. And then I went to pick my phone up. And she said, I don't like the way you're behaving. I'm going to have you removed from the train. And uh, she went away and uh, called some. One and then came back with a body cam on her and um then she started to question me and um and wind me up and try to get me to provoke me into you know, saying so yeah reaction so that she could say you know i'm i'm a threat or i'm breaking public order or whatever so I, I i started talking to her she said where are you going i told her where i was going i showed her my ticket and then she said, you were ignoring me weren't you uh, why were you ignoring me? And I just thought, I'm, I'm not going to say anything. And then she started saying, I'm really worried about you. Are, are you well? I'm really worried that you're not well. And so I said, I'm fine. Just really quietly and calmly. And then she said, yeah, but you're not behaving normally. I'm going to have you removed. And she, she, she made the threat again. And, and she was looking at me. Again, I just didn't say anything. And eventually she gave me my ticket back and walked off and nothing happened. But the frightening thing about that was I just used my right to silence. You know, you don't have to say anything to someone. She wasn't a police officer. Um, someone else had already checked my ticket on the train. And um, they were trying to twist things to make out that I had some kind of mental health problem. 
because I was just, you know, I just didn't want to uh, answer then questions about wearing a mask. It was very, very disturbing the way that, um, you know, this, this was just some, a person on the train, you know, was uh, trying to um, <laughs> insinuate that so that there may, and then get it on camera so someone could come in and uh, cart me off and lock me up or something, you know, yeah. heaven knows what would happen then. But, you know, this is, the government here has created a situation where people who would just normally get get on uh, are pitted against each other you know for the craziest of things you know you're wearing a mask or not wearing a mask if you've got a vaccine or you're not got a vaccine and you know as you said people who have got a vaccine you know if it's if it is a vaccine that works that's a whole other issue then they shouldn't be worried about people who don't have it you know i mean um i have a vaccine for what diphtheria and whooping cough and all that you know so for those things i'm protected i mean if you haven't got one i'm not bothered you know, because, you know, you haven't got one, I have got one, yeah. so fine. But this is a totally different yeah. type of thing. But you can yeah. catch, I don't know if many people know this, but mm. you can actually catch a virus through your eyeballs. Mm. Your eyeballs. Mm. You can catch viruses. So a plastic mask where there's holes at the side. Mm. If somebody's got something, you're going to fucking catch <laughs> it. Now, human beings have been on this planet, I don't know how long, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, I don't know. Mm. There's no, people have come up with the theories of somebody's at a bat, it's came from China. Every mm. disease on this planet is man-made, in my opinion. Mm. Everything has been created for mm. pure greed, pure money. Mm. You've got the plague, you've got wars, you've got the flus, mm. you've got everything. Yes, the immune system can shut down, but you have got an immune system for a reason, because it mm. will fight infections. Now, I don't have all the answers for it all. I can only read from what I read. Just because you watch a couple of YouTube videos, it does not, does not make me an mm. expert, but it's my soul. It's something inside mm. me that tells me something ain't right. Now, I could be crazy. You could be crazy. The person who gets the vaccine is crazy. I've always said it, divide and conquer. It's just another way to divide the world. Look at mm. how everybody's fighting. Look at everybody's mm. arguing. Why not? If you want to take the vaccine, fucking take it. Mm. But don't give me shit because I don't want to take it. I'm mm. not saying to people... Don't take it, don't do this, don't do that. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Mm. I'm not a scientist. But be all it means, choose your life. Choose what mm. you want to do. I'm not harming anyone. I'm fit and healthy. I don't know what the fuck's around the corner. I'm not trying to control your life. But people, it is scary how mm. easy people can be dumbed down to believe everything that they read and see. Instead of having a, a bit of common knowledge to maybe investigate, look at where these big companies are coming from, look at who's running them. Just mm. have a question, question the things. But people are just too scared now. Mm. Control them with fear and people are easily manipulated and it's scary like mm. do you know the stats and figures of deaths and the rates from it, it was it was high in last April year and may 2020 last yeah. year there was a big spike mm -hmm. in total mortality and that's the figure you got to look for i mean so i do have a bit of a science background so you know when, when they flash things up on the the television and they show a graph and i can immediately see what well, why are you you know your axes aren't labeled properly or you're presenting it in a certain way but you're only going back to this point and not that point and you very very quickly can see where they're trying to manipulate mm -hmm. data to make a, a propaganda point rather than a scientific point and um if, from the very beginning they've used modeling Modeling is not science. You know, Professor Ferguson's, mo Ferguson's modeling, the, he's suggesting half a million people are going to die if we don't lock the country down. But that wasn't based on real observation or real data. It was just an algorithm, and you can get any answer you want out of an algorithm by what you put into it. You know, so the whole. Um, political you know, policy decision making thing has not been based on data it's been based on modeling it's been political but you you, you got to look at hospitalizations you got to look at total mortality and they are below normal so you know there's from you know april this year there's absolutely no reason whatsoever for for any kind of restrictions i mean I, I don't think at all personally but even if you are looking on the basis of like well when when the hospitalizations and death stop then we open up you should have done it a long time ago you know so um yeah i i think there are you know better ways of dealing with this you know people always talk about hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin these antivirals that are very good at sort of relieving the symptoms of, of when you get this this thing uh whatever it is um in the early stages but um yeah i i'm shocked at uh how much we've been dumbed down like you say and i, I think this is something that's been going on for years and years in this country i mean the the level of understanding of maths and science has really gone 
down so much you know p- you know the general understanding of maths and science statistics in this country is is very very poor you know we're we're getting beaten now you know we've been been, been get, getting beaten by asian countries for years and years and years you know um you know having been a teacher it, occasionally you know uh, in, when i taught in independent schools you get someone coming over from hong kong uh joining the class and they're like well you know they they're 3 years ahead of of the english kids and and that's an in a private school i mean they really really do do you know pump the maths and science you know in china and korea south korea and vietnam hong kong singapore they're amazing at, at the subjects yeah. why there's no reason why we can't be at that level why but, do you think the schooling system is the way it is it's nothing's changed it's all crunch numbers learn your mm. times tables there's your history learn mm. about that people are coming out of school and they're feeling inadequate they don't feel good enough they mm. don't feel worthy it's just all about memorization mm. where's the creativity where's the individuality mm. where's the fucking your own choices the system here the schooling system there's i believe you should be getting taught about yoga finances mm. fucking even love and death and mm. she went taught about so many things but you're taught to sit at a desk four years old still sit at a desk at mm. 65 there's nobody's mm. living outside of their comfort zone anymore mm. what do you think of the schooling system that's in the uk just now I, I, I'm I'm not against you know um, didactic teaching, someone at the front teaching stuff and, and kids learning, but it's got to be productive. Yeah, and there's no point in sitting at a desk if you're just not doing anything and you're not being challenged at all. And and you know there should be different things. So nothing wrong with that, but it's got to be balanced with other things as well. So you know, like you're saying, fine, teaching kids about finance. I mean, that's so important. Um, people you know, understanding the economic system. If you did that, you've got power over your own life and power over your own finances. But that's all been taken away. Um, you, you know that used to be taught in home economics, um, but home economics now is, in a way, you know, it's, it's now just about cooking, you know, <laughs> which is great. I used to love home economics. <laughs> yeah, I used to cook muffins love and it. buns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's that's great it's really good but but you know along with that used to be sort of the what well, what well, how much do you need to to make a meal how much do you need to budget for your your house and your household and how do you make it out so you don't get into debt so that you, you you're getting an income and you're spending it you're not spending too much and you can save a little bit and then use that to to you know buy a bigger thing that's the sort of stuff that kids used to be taught, but it's been taken out. And that disempowers people. You know, but there's all this talk of empowerment, empowerment about this, this thing and that thing and the other. But the things that really empower kids is to have the, you know, the understanding of how to take control of your own life and your own finances and your own career and, um, you know, be your own man and be your own woman. And, and yeah. that's one of the things that, is not being taught you know and I, I do think that we should be far far more rigorous in teaching kids and expecting kids to to have a much higher level of academic excellence in things like maths and science and languages but you know also there's the you teach the kids the creative things like art and you know music that, that's got to come as well but that's often being removed um from curricula because it's it's too expensive or whatever and you know for a while uh, some schools especially in cities they've been selling off their school fields you know so they can get a bit of money build turn their school fields into housing developments they get a bit of money but then the, the kids have got no place to to do sport you know or they have to hire out something else somewhere you know somewhere else in another venue so there's been such an attack on um education system but you know I, I i do think that it's also been deliberately targeted by people who want to use it to undermine um society as well you know with the whole sort of cultural marxism and, and those kind of um ideologies that are coming into school and uh, you, you know at the moment for example you got the whole black lives matter thing blew up and you, you know of course black lives matter but as an organization it's marxist it's against the family it's against capitalism it's against the police it's against um society you know maintaining a sort of you know being safe and 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 everything they just kind of want to uh stir up division between people based on race and um I don't think there's any need for it in this country. You know, it doesn't matter what. I mean, I just look at someone and you're a person. 
you know i don't care what your color is but now they're making this a really big issue and uh, it's going into schools and you have diversity week black history week black history month or all, all these kind of things uh, and and uh, kids are sort of learning why you know this group is is disadvantaged and they're victims when they're not really but then this group is should be guilty for what someone might have done in the past you know and that's just this is not the things to teach kids to you know make them uh, well-rounded whole people who are you know self-confident this this is something that people teach kids in order to you know destroy their spirit and and also you know by extension destroy the spirit of the nation as well yeah. what do you think about like the transgenders doing story times at school with kind of speaking to primary ones and primary twos it's appalling isn't it i am I'm, i think it's it's terrible i mean who asked the parents if this could happen i mean i think most of them would say no De definitely not i mean the whole transgender agenda is confusing kids about what um you know biological sexes you're male or you're female and now kids are to be brought up you know being taught oh you can decide your gender when you decide no you're either a boy or you're a girl you know you, you tell a kid this is what you are and, and because this is what nature's made you and, you know you might not be interested in the same things as oh, the other boys or the other girls but you know to expose them to this transgenderism and you know some of the material which goes in is very very confusing to the kids i mean it's 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 propaganda to try to teach them and undermine you teach them things which are not true and to undermine the scientific reality that there are two sexes based on your anatomy and your chromosomes uh, i was reading there that they're in the uk as well that they're trying to bring down the age of sex to mm. have sex from 16 to 12 mm. what's your opinions on this of course they're not it's terrible it, it was increased if i think back in 1885 um specifically to protect kids from um pimps who were getting teenagers to get into prostitution it was it was lower back in you know the before that date and the, you know that was um something that you know is lost in history now but the, the the reason it's 16 is to protect children from exploitation yeah who would want to bring that back down to 12 again i mean then everybody who's been in one of these grooming gangs and has like raped a teenager would, would then be be guiltless that they'd be innocent then according to the law wouldn't it that that's what that's what this is about so that people can then go and exploit kids and and then they can just get away with it i mean it's absolutely wrong yeah it shouldn't be brought down at all it's sickening but do you think all these things are getting put in place because then it becomes the norm to be talking about this crazy shit to then mm. plant the seeds now for five years time mm. to bring the age down and people think okay it's okay because even snapchat i was watching something that snapchat used to have a filter where it put masks on people mm. five years ago eight years ago i don't know how snap maybe five six years ago used to have a filter when it put masks on people everybody was doing the mask things and doing their stories mm. the reason being because this person thinks it's because conditioning people's minds mm. to then think that masks are normal snapchat was the second most used app i think on the right. planet at one point mm. so the more they were using it at its popularity it becomes normal it's in your back of your psyche somewhere so when people start wearing masks i walk mm. about and see people and i think fuck me man like I just it looks, just looks crazy. I can understand mm. maybe people trying to protect each other from viruses, this and that. But actually, do a little bit of research, you realise wait a minute, you're actually getting mm. manipulated to a certain degree. Yeah, like all these things are getting put in place. But even though there's laws change, they start getting changed from 10, 20 years prior. They start planting these seeds to then make these yeah. laws different. Like whoever controls, the, whoever the people in behind power have already got mm. the things in place 20 years 30 years 40 years in advance they're already advanced to what's coming for the future we're just the escape we're just the fucking guinea pigs even for mobile phones and apps and technology we don't know the damage it's going to do in 20 30 40 years time but like back in the day you used to have doctors smoking fags saying they were so healthy for you and adverts <laughs> so things do change and you're always speaking out about free speech mm. why um, you know, where it comes from is I'm a Christian. And I think that uh, things that I uh, would like to say have been, you know, I've been attacked uh, for that. And, and I'll tell you where, where it started. Um, well, it's before this, but, but I was standing 
uh, in 2017, I stood for the the leadership of UKIP. I'm not in UKIP anymore. I've I've started a new party, the Heritage Party. But at the time, that's what I was doing. And I answered a questionnaire for a little group which which was in the party called Support for the Family. And there was like I didn't think anyone would see it. And there were a lot of questions. There were questions about Islam. There were questions about LGBT stuff and um, and transgender stuff and things like this. And and you know one of the questions was. Um, uh, do do you think um, that uh, you know that there are two sexes and so on? I said, yeah, I do. I do agree with that. And then there was another one asking about, well, what do you think about um, the definition of marriage? Do you, do you agree with the you know the, the allowing of same sex marriage? My opinion is, I don't. I don't agree with that. I'm. I'm. And that was a you know, I think that's an acceptable opinion. Lots of people have that opinion uh, and some other things, but. There was an absolute outpouring of rage at me just because I'd dared to say I I don't agree with same sex marriage. Um, you know, if you do, that's fine. I can disagree with you, fine. But because I had that opinion, the opposite opinion, there was a huge um, move of people um, by by a sort of group um, that that uh, tried to get me kicked out of the the leadership contest, get kicked out of the party, kicked off the London Assembly just for having that opinion and some other opinions as well to do with the whole issue. And I thought, well, well this is crazy. I mean, some of you say you're for freedom of speech. Speech. But when I stand up and say something you don't like, you want to try to cancel me. And, you know, from then I, you know, I started seeing many, many more examples of people being cancelled. And, you know, at that time, it was people, you know, being uh, kicked out of universities, not being allowed to speak at debating societies, whether it's, you know, Jordan Peterson or Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's a victim of FGM, so brave Somalian ex-Muslim, you know, nothing against Muslims. She just happens to be ex-Muslim and uh, tells a story and, you know, just brave story, but she was um, no platform for that. And now, you know, people like J.K. Rowling are getting no platforms. And again, I don't agree with everything she says, but she's, I would agree with her on the, the, the sort of biology, you know, and uh, the, the, the there are two sexes thing. So, but that's gone on from there and now it's not just people being no platformed people are being kicked out of their jobs for having the wrong opinion and you know you had the case was resolved last week of Maya Forstater who said the same thing uh, she thinks there are two sexes and she was a tax accountant and she was thrown out of her job and the, the, the original tribunal you might know the story said that that opinion uh, has no place in a democratic society so how can you a judge say that you know if someone thinks that you know a man can't become a woman that you're not allowed to say that in a democracy and then someone can be thrown out of their job for having that opinion on the internet somewhere completely different from their job and that's absolutely fine you know, but she challenged that, she appealed it, and then the appeal tribunal, that was overturned. And the judge said, oh, that does have a place in democratic society. I mean, it took him like years to sort of like figure that out in, in the judgment. But but this is sort of where we are. Uh, and, and this is the kind of cancelling that's going on that is just now, we're, we're like in Orwell land, isn't it? Where, where they say, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? This is five fingers. Well, no, no it's not. But, you know, unless you say it is, you're going to get, you know, stuck in prison and, and someone beat you over the head. So this this is kind of where we are. So free speech is very important. Uh, where do you think it's all going in the future for London and the whole of the UK? Well, we got to push back. You know, if we don't push back and if the people don't stand up for sanity and what's right, then we're going to go crazy, isn't it? I mean, you, you an interesting thing this uh, week was I saw... Um, there was a student in Harvard uh, from North Korea called uh, Junmi Park, I think. And she, she got a bit of attention in the Twitter sphere this week for saying, even North Korea is not this crazy. 
You know, she's talking about Harvard, all of the indoctrination in the top Ivy League universities, which you get here in, in Oxbridge and the universities as well. It's absolutely insane. The sort of cultural Marxist, you know, conditioning and uh, the, the destruction of the foundations of our culture. And, you know, even just, just things which are sane and scientific are being, you know, derided and, and being, you know, kicked out of society. Everything has been turned on its head. That will go on and on and on. It won't stop until everything has gone and been destroyed. Unless we, the people, stand up and say, no, we're not having it. We are going to re rebuild and reestablish the foundations of our nation. You know, and I, I, as a Christian, as I said before, I, I, mean, I think that that is a big part of it, you know, because it works. You know, you, might, you don't have to be, you know, a born again Christian or something. But if you, you understand that a society that's built on the, the Ten Commandments and that has those sort of principles and, and an understanding of, you know, uh, reason and rationalism and liberty that, that comes out of it, it works. And, and, you know, people have a, you're all on the same, in the same framework and you can have the freedom within that to sort of, you know, look after yourself and, 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 and build your own life but you you consider each other and um you know that you you put the family and you put your nation at, at the heart of things and um uh, and that's a framework for you to live in but you know what people want to do they want to destroy the nation they want to destroy the faith they want to destroy the family family is particularly under attack you know the the traditional nuclear family mother father have their own children bring up their own children that has been massively under attack for decades and decades and it's a good thing you know because children uh every study that has been done on you know the the, the sort of outcomes for children is that you know, in general they do better uh, if they're brought up with their own mother and father. Of course, there are some people who do well who, who aren't brought up in a traditional family, but it is a really good, solid foundation for bringing up children. It's natural, isn't it? I mean, you know, 30 years ago, no one would even think about it. But now you have people questioning that all the time and uh, deriding it. So, you know, we need to rebuild the foundations of our country again and push back against this. Otherwise, there's not going to be anything left. Yeah, it's scary, but the people who do push back, the people who do question it, are the ones who are ridiculed, are the ones who are called mm. crazy. Now, it's scary now. You look mm -hmm. at um, the lockdown not stopping on the 21st of June, but yet all the M&A, what is it, G, G7? The G7 G7 Summit, G7 yeah. Summit, they're all standing next to each other with their champagne, no masks yeah. on. Why are you people taking that? Why the fuck can you not look and see in their face? Yeah. Like, why are these people leading our country, the world, and yet look at them laughing in your face? We need new leaders, don't we? They're appalling. I'm really, it's disgusting, isn't but it? But then again, it's yeah. the people behind them. Mm. Those people also are pulling the strings. These aren't the leaders of the real evil. Mm. They're part of the game. But mm. it's the people who are behind them. What's a great reset to you? Well, it's something that's real, isn't it? It's the World Economic Forum wants to bring this in. It's it's basically, you know, it's it's a sort of bizarre twenty first century hybrid of communism, fascism, and a new thing which is technocracy uh, that they want to bring in. So it'll be like communism with artificial intelligence and and the new technology that we've got, you know, with a a complete control system like this this Chinese Communist Party social credit system that, you know, it's all up and running in China already. So it's basically that's what they want to turn the West into. And um, you know, you had a communist revolution in in Russia with the Bolsheviks back in nineteen seventeen and then China followed on in the nineteen forties, forty five and so on. And then it never happened in the West really but it's happening now we're pretty much going you know we're having a, a communist revolution but it, you, we don't see it as such because it's not a quick violent revolution it's it's been done without bloodshed um but this is what the the communists of the time um advocated you know with the whole frankfurt school and the, the sort of communist thinkers who were perplexed at why uh, a revolution didn't take place in in Western nations. They tried it. You know, people tried to have a violent revolution. There, there was one in Austria, and there was one in Hungary. There was one in Bavaria, but they were very, very short lived. And then, you know, capitalism took back over again. Um, Italy as well. Um, but they they were sort of thinking, why is it not happening 
in the West. And so the the thinkers of the time said, well, in order to make it happen, it's not going to happen in the West quickly and violently. It's going to be slowly, we'll have to slowly undermine the culture, get into all the institutions, corrupt the institutions, corrupt their values, corrupt their principles, change them, educate a new generation of kids in the new way of thinking, and then the generation after that. And this has been going on for sort of a hundred years, slowly, 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 until now we're at the point of crisis where everything is being enacted. And there is the very quick change coming from, you know, freedom, liberty, capitalism, whatever. I don't, I, you know, I, I like capitalism. I don't like corporatism, oligarchic corporatism, which is sort of what we got now. But that's what they want in the future. You know, the corporatists, which is basically fascism. You know, it's it's Italian fascism, where the state decides who can run a business. You know, you have all these massive businesses. Um, small businesses are destroyed and, and gone under. But every, you know, the state says, you know, decides who who can who can operate the business. So the the state doesn't own everything, but it controls everything. Thing. Yeah. Um, and added to that, you've got the, the the sort of new technology and the the AI to you know the the, the, the total monitoring system that's going to come in with with five G and satellites and so on that they want to to look at your every move and your every transaction, your every word. You know, maybe not your thoughts, but you know they're probably <laughs> not, try yeah, to think they're probably <laughs> soon then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they say they don't know what every move, but. Then again, we have Facebook, Instagram, and mm. Twitter. Mm -hmm. We've got phones. The people say, oh, I'll never get chipped. What have you got in your pocket? Mm. What have you got in your hand? You are fucking chipped. Like, I'm addicted to social media. Mm. Now, I can preach all this shit and talk <laughs> about it, but yet <laughs> you know. I'm still sucked in because not feeling too good, I'll post a photo, talk about debates, get involved, whatever. I don't really get involved as much online because it's people behind screens. You can't have a civilised conversation with somebody... You can't have a disagreement with someone and just have a conversation. Mm. Like me and you're just having a chat. Yeah. We're kind of on the same path, but if we never, it's just a discussion. It's your beliefs, my beliefs, somebody's belief, whether it's Christianity, whatever religion you, mm. let's just have a chat. Let's mm. just talk. Why can people not just sit around the table and talk? Mm. Don't force your opinions on me. I won't force my opinions on you. This is why I believe what I do. Let's talk about why you agree what you do. So mm. it's just, you can't have a civilized conversation. Mm online because people just want to attack their shots they go mm. he's not agreeing with me so they attack and they dig up shit and they talk shit it's difficult mm -hmm. how worried are you for the kids of this generation oh very worried i mean they're being attacked at every level aren't they i mean in schools i mean schools are not what they used to be and you know i haven't taught in a in a school now for for sort of six years because i've been you know actively in politics on the assembly but um yeah i it's really tough isn't it i mean that's why a lot of parents are now thinking about taking their kids out of school and homeschooling them because there's so many things coming at them you know the government wants to dump this on them and that on them there's the vaccines coming their way there's the you know relationships and sex education that they've just made compulsory which is going to bring in really highly sexualized material to kids and you know even kids themselves say i think that we're just you know you know guinea pigs for some adult ideology you know the people that, that are looking you know eight-year-old kids are like what well, you know some of them who have got a little bit more uh, you know self-confidence to speak and and um, articulate what they're they're seeing is that why why are we learning this why can't you just let us be kids in the past you know you let kids be kids primary school kids you used to play with trains and you know make you know make paintings and stuff like yeah. that you know now they want to like teach them about you know drag queen this and you know this act and that act and you know i've seen some of the material that's um you know gone into schools and it is it's absolutely shocking you know there's things in there that i've never heard of you know that they're, <laughs> they're teaching to well, I, I wouldn't want to stay mm. here in a mm. polite company but uh, you know mm. some of the stuff that i've seen you know it, it you know recommended in you know warwickshire and, and and other counties that are going into schools it's like Kids is, are exposed to this stuff, you know, you know, that the parents wouldn't even know. It's like, well, why is this happening? Why is the purpose behind that? Well, I mean, it's... What's the other excuse? It's the thing, you know, we're talking about before. They want to lower the age of consent. And coming from the UN and the World Health Organizations, the concept of children's sexual rights. 
so that you know that, that um, children will that what they want to roll out with this there's a program of comprehensive sexuality education it's been rolled out all around the world um, I was speaking to someone in Wales you know yesterday is fighting it they're just going to introduce it in Wales next year they're one of the last ones because it's already happened in England and Scotland and um, yeah they, they want uh, children to be you know basically have the sexual rights of adults lower the, the age of consent and say well you know from the age of 10 uh, you pretty much can decide what you want to do you, you know the, your parents won't be responsible for you the state will be and you can make your own decisions about everything you know I, I wonder if you know I'm just sort of thinking off the top of my head here I wonder if reducing the voting age is, is part of that as well you know sort of in Scotland and Wales it's been reduced from 18 to 16 why you could reduce it lower and you know give them you know, rights to do this and that and the other. And, um, you know, parents would then... It takes the responsibility for for bringing up kids away from parents and uh, gives it to the state. So the state basically own your kids. And uh, if parents complain about it, then, you know, they'll come and take your kids away from you. And, and, and this is happening. Like, it, it is. They're not old enough to vote, but you're old enough to fucking have sex. Like, pff, there's no just way. some wicked people behind mm -hmm. this shit that... Like, I don't know all the answers to it. I'm wary of everything that is in the school curriculum. Mm. I'm wary of what's in the vaccines that are getting placed in schools. Now, mm. some of these schools and around the world are just giving kids vaccines without the parents' consent. Mm. I think some schools in England actually done that. I know some yeah. people kicked up a fuss. Like, if somebody's sticking a needle in my kid's fucking arm, like, I'm going to go fucking right. mental. Like, you don't have the right to make those choices. But I yeah. think it's getting to that stage where people are getting squeezed and squeezed that mm. people are just letting things happen. And that's a scary place to be. What if I happen to standing strong and standing tall mm. and, and fighting for your rights and fighting what you believe? Like people have just dumbed right down where they've just accepted it. Mm. Well, I'm saying just accepted it, but there's been rallies and marches in London with over a million people. Mm. I believe there's another one on the 26th of June yeah. where... People are going to stand and and sp and, and there's no violence, there's no oh, fights, there's no an there's no anger, yeah. there's no frustration. You mm. can't have peaceful protests, which is a beautiful thing. Like yes, people can call you a conspiracy theory, but I'm just open minded to mm. something ain't fucking right. My soul's telling me something ain't right. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. I could be crazy. I believe we're all crazy, mm. and so we're on a certain degree. We're all kind of little fucking mm. wires a mess, but. I just don't want to be lied to. Why can't we have a, a beautiful life? Why can't we have a peaceful life, a loving life? Like we do walk along the streets. I don't see any violence. I don't see any racism. Mm. I don't see any body fighting. I don't see things getting stolen. Up. The world is a great place, but we just mm. seems to turn on the radio or look on social media or mm. watch your TV. You are brainwashed to think the world's, listen, the world is corrupt to certain degrees for the people mm. running it, but it's not, a, it's actually a decent place. People are decent, mm. but they're just, for me, too easily controlled. Mm. Maybe we just need to turn off our televisions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just watch stuff that's like this. Yeah, right, that's it. You get it yeah. like it is. Uh -huh. What do you think about the, the protest on the 26th of June? Oh, it's going to be great. You you be know, I've been to so many. Uh, it's from the beginning. You know, I went to the first one. It was, you know... Um, last year? Last year. It was when there were only 50 people and the police went in really, really hard and arrested people and then there was another one there were 300 people and they went in really hard again and I, I spoke at one of them in Trafalgar Square last September and uh, it was a wonderful beautiful rally you know loads of 20,000 people there but I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes you know columns of riot police coming in attacking the crowds attacking the stage you know beating people with their batons and it was entirely peaceful you know um, and at that point I was absolutely shocked that in England, in the middle of London, the police were attacking peaceful citizens for no reason whatsoever. It's absolutely appalling. Um, uh, and when they started up again, I mean, there, there wasn't so much going on over the winter because it was cold. People didn't want to come out so much. And I think people t were to, to some extent demoralised. But there was, a, there was one started, I think it was the March the 15th or something like that. And uh, fifty to a hundred thousand people turned up. It was started in in Hyde Park, and at the beginning, uh, the police were doing their usual thing of trying to pick off people one by one, arrest them, cart them off. But 
just that there came a moment where there were just suddenly so many people uh, that they stopped and they, they couldn't they couldn't carry on, you know, arresting people um, and picking people off like they'd done before. And uh, and now there's, you know, one every two, three or four weeks. And, uh, you know, there was one, what, three weeks ago. The next one's going to be 26th of, of June. And, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people now every time which is fantastic. You know, I've been to every single one. I will go to every single one. And uh, I went to one last week, actually, a smaller one in Glastonbury, and I uh, spoke there, and it was fantastic. Only 300 people. But the nice thing was, you know, the police just left everybody alone there, and they just left people to get on, listen to music, listen to speakers, have a good time, hug each other, you know, be with each other. And there's no problem whatsoever. Absolutely no problem at all. It's just, just people being yeah. normal and doing what they normally do. What do you think of Julian Assange? Oh, well, he's a, he's a hero, isn't he? I mean, he's a, and he's been treated terribly. He shouldn't be in prison. Um, they've just made stuff up to keep him there. I mean, first of all, this was this very dubious rape charge in, in Sweden, which has been dropped. And even when it was dropped, they kept him in because apparently what he he didn't, go in for bail a bail like you just show up at the police station and then one time he missed a you know bail attendance at a police station what seven years ago or something so they've kept him in a prison for that you know and now um even when the uh uh the american government lost the case when they tried to extradite him back on the 4th of january i was there and uh but they still went back to belmarsh I mean, this is appalling. He's a political prisoner in the UK. I mean, we shouldn't have political prisoners. We're not the sort of country that, that should have it. We, you know, you, got, you get our government and they criticise Iran, they criticise China, they criticise North Korea. Yeah, rightly so. But they're doing the same thing to Julian Assange here in this country. And all he's done is journalism. He hasn't told a lie. He should be out. This is appalling. How do you think when you start speaking out that... The people do discredit you does that have a fearful for you it used to be but i don't care anymore because i just <laughs> speak the truth you know and in in there's so many people who who see things and and you, you know they're afraid to speak speak out but i hope i can give people more courage by by speaking out and you know i might get it wrong sometimes you know i i, I try not to i try to look at things and, uh, and and think about what's right and and what should be happening and you know, and speak up for people who are being treated unjustly and things that are are, are being done which are, are destructive to our country and our world and, you know, just speak about them. Um, but a good indicator of what's right is if you uh, you look at the BBC and see what they're saying and the opposite is true, you know, so yeah. <laughs> on the mainstream media. It's, that's a pretty, usually a pretty good indication of, uh, of, of what, what's actually true and what's not. So... Um, but you know, you, yeah. I, for it, it was tough, you know. And and uh, in the London Assembly, when I was there, they had motions on, on all kinds of various things. And uh, you know, one one of the first things I I said was that you know I'm against mass rapid immigration, which is uncontrolled because of the effects it has uh, on you know working people in this country. And I was heckled and pilloried by you know all the other parties, uh, including one from the, the Tory party, who's very, very pro-mass immigration. And um, and it was tough, you know, the first time you speak up and you get heckled live on television in the chamber because it's all recorded and it goes out on the Parliament channel. Um, but, you know, I'm glad I did it because, you, you know, you get, you grow a thicker skin and um, and you get more confidence and you sort of figure out what's going on. So you plunge into the deep end and if you if you... Um, if you don't sink and if you swim, then uh, if you float, then, uh, you know, you, you've got the strength, you've got more strength to do it next yeah, time. I always say that you've got to mm. keep swimming in life, mm. man. Just make sure the tide will get big sometimes, the, mm. the waves will crash against you, but you must keep swimming, never sink. Yeah, What's your opinion on immigration? Well, it's it's been too high for 25 years or more. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's Blair or Brown or Cameron, May, now Johnson we've had mass immigration and 
we shouldn't have had it. We should have been training our own young people with the skills they need to do the jobs that need to be done in this country. You know, no, not bringing people in uh, en masse. You, you, you know, you, you see at the moment, you've got probably 20,000 people a year coming across the channel. That's what it's going to be this year, last year. You know, that's going to continue unless we get a change of government because they talk about doing something, but they don't do anything. I mean, they've been talking about stopping it for years, but, you know, they just, Pretty Patel gets up and makes a speech, how terrible it is, and we must think about having a meeting to discuss doing something possibly in the future at some point. But nothing happens, nothing changes. Um, immigration come, keeps going. Um, but, but that's tiny compared to the what you don't see. You know, it's very easy to see people coming across in dinghies and getting picked up by the border force, where they should actually be just be sending them back to France. But, you know, that, but that's happening. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's many, many times more people coming over in the backs of lorries, you know, like those 27 Vietnamese that, that um, were found dead in the back of a refrigerated lorry in Tilbury last year. You know, that was just... Um, it's terrible that you know they were found and they were dead but that's, you know, that's just it's very sad but you know so we we saw we saw that but how many more are coming over every day i mean there's many many times more people coming over in these lorries than than you see coming over on the dinghies you know and they're coming over on flights early in the morning um you know to landing and not sort of probably checked in that's been happening for years and years and years and yeah, when it comes to the EU, they they um, there was this um, what do they call it? The uh, secure status scheme for EU citizens who are living in the the UK to have se settled status. That was it. So you live here uh, when when the the, the sort of um, contract was signed with the EU, they could stay, and they they estimated there'd be three million. But there's five million, five million. Uh, applied for settled status rather than three million. So there's two million more were here uh, than, than the highest estimate that anyone has said before. You know, so so it's been out of control for so so long. You know, we're told that the official um, population of the UK is 69 million. Well, it's probably more like 75 million. Think so? I think so. Well, you got there's two million right there you know, from the settled status that they didn't know about. So there's another 2 million straight away. And they're here legally. Um, how many have come in on the back of a lorry illegally and are just working like slaves on someone's farm or as domestic servants somewhere? You know, they're, they're, this is going on. There's modern slavery all around us, but we don't see it because it's, you know, people are, it's almost like the Gulag Archipelago in a way, but in a different sort of way. You know, it's, it's there, but coming in, uh, being transported to places, you know, either working in nail bars, you know, this, this you can see uh, all over the place. There's a proliferation of nail bars everywhere. Never used to be nail bars. Now they're all over the place. I mean, I don't know why. <laughs> it's not something that I, I need for myself. But, you know, I mean, joking aside, some of the people there are, you know, here illegally and they're being paid you know really really poor wages they're being exploited um but nothing seems to be good done about it what's your opinion for brexit then you for brexit i'm totally for brexit i was completely for brexit i campaigned for it <laughs> for for a long time and i was really really happy when it happened yeah um because i don't think that it's the right future for the uk i mean i love europe I love the countries of Europe, you know, absolutely. I've, I've lived in Bosnia uh, for two years. I've travelled to many of them. Um, but I don't think the EU is a good thing because it's undemocratic and it's taking power and sovereignty away from us and it will stop us as a nation from being able to do what we want to do as a nation. Yeah. How do you look at it then from you, leaving the UK and working in other countries for people from other countries want to come here but we have to send them back? Do you understand that yeah. as well? Well, I mean, for me, I, I, everything I did was legal, you know, and I, I, I worked as a teacher teaching chemistry in different countries and, and there were there was a job there for me. You know, people specifically wanted, you know, international teachers. So, you know, I, I applied for the job before I got, got the visa before I got there. And um, the, the job was for, you know, there was not a local person to do the job. And actually, when I was in Bosnia, I did train a local person to, to do the job and she took over for 
from me and she's still the chemistry teacher there now in the school so you know i was uh, actually in a way helping to you, you know tra train uh, the, the system and help the, the system and the country so very proud of, of doing that but um yeah look it, i'm i'm not against immigration i'm not saying shut the door but i'm saying it's got to be purposeful and useful and it should be balanced you know i mean you can have 300,000 people a year coming in if there's 300,000 people going. But if you have 800,000 people coming in and 300,000 going, then, you know, where are, where's the homes for everybody? You know, where's the hospital places for everybody? Where's the schools for all the children? They aren't there. So it just doesn't work, you know, and that, that's what's causing huge pressure on all of our public services. And it's got just got worse and worse and worse yeah. because no one will address that. And, and then, you know, it's it, the other people that say, you know, they would say just talking about that is bigoted. Well, it's just a simple fact. You know, you've got to you've got to address these things, and you've got to make sure it's balanced. You know, I wouldn't mind now a period of um, net emigration. I think a period of net emigration would be very mean? good, um, where there are more people leaving than coming in. So we've had net immigration oh, yeah, for, yeah, for, yeah. for twenty five mm -hmm. years, but you know, I, I I would be happy with a period where there's more people leaving than coming in because that would balance things over the long term. So and you're it thinking would... more jobs for the people who live here, more jobs. Of course, yeah, um, less hospital bills, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. What about wars? Your opinion on wars? I think just about every war that's been fought in our lives lifetime lifetime, with maybe one exception. Is, uh, is is being absolutely the wrong thing for the country to get involved in. I mean, Iraq, Syria, um, you know, Libya, it, it's just been disastrous, you know, for, for the people there and for us. The only war I think that, that there was any justification for, for us doing, and an absolute justification, was the Falklands War, you know, because uh, the Falklands were invaded by, by a foreign power we had to fight, you know, you know to... Um, the, the people who live there want to remain British, um, so so we were right to to uh, to go there and make sure it remained British. But without exception, I think that um, you know a lot of them have just been you know whipped up on the most spurious and and dodgy pretexts. You know the the dodgy dossier. It's known. You know the Blair's dodgy dossier yeah, saying there was so much blood in his hands. weapons of mass destruction and there weren't. You no, know, yeah, no weapons. No, so many people mm. lost their life. Yeah, uh, what do you think of the state of Syria just now? It's a it's a sh an absolute liberty for what's going on over there. Mm. It's it's such a mess, isn't it? And I, I don't know the current state of it because there's so much going on, but there's four or five different factions, aren't there, fighting? Um, I mean, you, you know, I think ISIS has been mostly dealt with now, hasn't it? But I um, don't hear anything of that anymore. Not, not really here. I think Turkey is controlling a little bit of it around the border. Um, the Kurds have been stuffed over, I think. My, personally, I think that, uh, you know... The Kurds should have their own country. You know, they're a ethnic group. Why They're the, the largest ethnic group in the world that doesn't have their own country. But the reason they don't have their own country is going back to the, the Pico-Sykes agreement in the 1920s where the, the British and the French carved up the Ottoman Empire when it collapsed. And then they created, oh, we're going to just draw map, borders on the map. So we'll have Iraq here and Syria there and Jordan here, Lebanon there, Israel there. Uh, they didn't think about the Kurds. And so they got a raw deal. They never got their own country when they could have done um so that's caused an awful lot of problems but um you know but uh yeah, Assad is made out to be a monster that they need to get rid of well I mean it's probably not a great guy but you know if you get rid of him who's is, is probably going to be worse isn't it that's what happened in Iraq you know Saddam Hussein not a great guy but you, you got rid of him and uh the country's you know, just fell into into disastrous chaos you know it's um so us getting involved in things that we don't know anything about and we've got no sort of plan to you know deal with it and build the nation again i mean it's just absolutely destructive yeah, libya is the same just greed though you get mm. poppy fuels gold yeah. oil and it's crazy to think that again was it golf katonka incident what was that one? Oh, the 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 gulf of tonkin vietnam the, yeah the yeah, gulf yeah. of tonkin vietnam like that yeah. was a lie. Yeah. That was, was all a lie. I know. Like, that was all over everywhere that people accepted that, okay, it's okay, they'll send the troops there and 
It was all bullshit. Snap. Tony Blair. Absolutely again, appalling. Weapons yeah. of mass destruction. No weapons. Mm. It's just the people behind it. Pure greed. Pure power. Yeah. Mm. But again, do we have all the information to say that it is all wrong or mm. what is all right? We just don't know about it for your gut feeling. It just, mm. something doesn't smell right with all this. Yeah. What about the policing in the UK? Do you think there should be more police? Do you think there should be less? Do you think there should be handle situations better? I think they should be um, doing their, their proper job. You know, they, sh they shouldn't be politicised. Serving the public. Yeah, they should be. There needs to be more community policing, which has been completely decimated. I mean, what, what they're doing now is reactive. It's almost entirely reactive. Someone calls up with a crime, they go there. By the time they get there, it's too late to deal with it. Um, I'm actually looking with interest at the new police commissioner for Greater Manchester because he's making some good sounds about actually, you know, we're, we're not going to... The public are fed up with wokery and, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to investigate all burglaries. You know, we're not... No crime is too small to investigate. And uh, we, we're going to have more community policing. Community policing is vital. It's not an add-on. Uh, extra that you do that you can get rid of and cut your budget for it it actually cuts crime and it it, it enhances the relationship between the community and the police and he was in um south yorkshire before uh, as the police commissioner apparently that's one of the best police forces because they actually have uh, put community policing at the heart of their strategy which is to you know Build, build relationships, see what's going on, get intelligence, and then, you know, actually fight crime rather than, you know, try to meet targets or, you know, be diverse and all this kind of nonsense, you know. So so that's very interesting. So I'm going to see, you know, if, if he does a good job in Greater Manchester, you know, he, he's, he's just going to, he's just basically old school, you know. It's yeah. coming back. That's Sometimes what we you need. need that, yeah. yeah. You started your own party as well. Yeah. That's what, right. Tell me about that. <laughs> Her the Heritage Party. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm really proud of that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I, I, it's basically about a year ago we first sort of started to set it up and then applied uh, to the Electoral Commission. So yeah, um, it's essentially a socially conservative party. That's what it's about. And, you know, it's saying so the Conservative Party are not conservative at all. They're not doing what a Conservative Party should be doing, you know. Um, and Labour is completely abandoned the labouring man. I mean, they're not about jobs and businesses anymore. They're about this kind of insane, you know, wokery and green agenda and so on. So, so we need something that's just basically common sense. So, you know, look at our manifesto. I've written the manifesto in terms of principles and, and sort of, you know, so we're for... National sovereignty, which includes Brexit, um, traditional family values, supporting the family, low immigration, financial responsibility, self-sufficiency and skills, uh, looking after our environment. But that means, you know, preserving the greenness of our countryside, not the whole sort of green agenda where you're actually paving it over and, and uh, you know, turning agricultural land into to solar panels and this kind of thing, you know, which which is is really anti anti green in a way um and um yeah for for uh equality before the law as well you know because it's very important that we get that you know common sense back into police crime and justice so yeah so i'm really proud of how it's gone and uh, do have a look at it and uh, and uh, we are going to be standing in the locals and we're looking for candidates so you know if you, if you like the look of it there's there's plenty of opportunity to get involved and uh, become a member become a candidate and um, what i want to do is build it um, so that when the, the general election comes we've got enough uh, good candidates to be able to stand everywhere for westminster so we want to give people a, a real choice to set this country right again. We need uh, is it hard being involved in politics? Does it not feel as if you're banging your head against the wall sometimes? Oh, it's so hard. I mean, get, <laughs> oh, going into the London <laughs> Assembly, it's like walking uh, through treacle. It's like going that? into the bear pit, you uh, know? Is it difficult? <laughs> it is Are you an outcast involved in the, the, the politics kind of stuff? I don't see many politicians speaking out the way you speak out. Like, mm. is that, uh, yeah, is that, I'm is that difficult? Especially in London, yeah, I feel like I'm... Do really... any of the other politicians agree with what you're saying but are just too scared or they just think you're all fucking... Some you think of, you're loopy? Some of the Tories come up and they say, oh, I agree with everything you said, but they wouldn't say it themselves. Why? 
because they're scared to death of being called a homophobe or a bigot or a xenophobe or an Islamophobe or any other kind of phobe. They're, they're absolutely terrified of being called a name. The thing is, I've been called all the names in the book, you know? So it's like, mm. I've done that. Now mm. now people know me, you know, I get I get sort of hatchet jobs done on me all the time by, you know, when I was standing um, for the the mayor election and I, I didn't have hardly any interviews with mainstream media, but I had one with ITV and we talked for ages. We talked about uh, police, crime, transport, you know, housing, all the issues. And she said, she said um, so, so tell me about the Heritage Party. I said, oh, well, we're this, we're this. Uh, and I said, we stand for traditional family values. And she said, oh, what does that mean? And I said, well, I think marriage is a man and a woman. And uh, isn't that homophobic? And uh, when they did the cut, that was about all that was on there. You know, none of the other stuff about, you know, police and and housing and transport and bicycle lanes. It was just that that's the bit they wanted. You know, have you been called a racist yet? I've been called a racist, which is quite hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you get sort of uh, liberal London woke karate call me racist, you know. And uh, I don't know what they're thinking. I say, look, look at my face. <laughs> Do you think I'm a racist? But... <laughs> they, they sort of how don't does that it. affect you at the start because we all mm. get affected by words mm. no matter who we are how did that affect you at the start mentally did it was that ever very, make you want to quit or anything it was very difficult because you know i always thought you know i'm 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 just trying to do good and you know i was i was a teacher for a long time so just you know obviously you have your battles with the kids about their behavior and stuff which is a, is a different thing but here i thought well i'm coming in because i want to do do something good for the country and stuff and then you get people just you know casting you as a nasty horrible person and it's really difficult because you're where is this coming from there's all these people who are just at you trying to say you're you're racist you're a homophobe you're a bigot i get called uncle tom i got called coconut i get called worse things than that you know now i get called an anti-vaxxer i get called conspiracy theorist a, a crank a nut job you know because i'm not towing the line on the whole lockdown and, and vaccine narrative you know so I've, I've got all the kind of insults but you know now now it doesn't bother me you know it's, it's a badge of honor you know that the, the, the people who who are they've got no arguments you see they've got no they've got nothing to say you know as, like we talked about before i talk about well immigration is not good because it's so you know it's putting pressure on public services you're a racist well argue the point what's what, what do you not have any you know counter argument to, to what i've just said i mean are public services enhanced by mass immigration you know make the point um but they won't they'll just come and say well no no you're racist you're xenophobe you're a bigot um and, and this is the kind of level of debate that you get from the people who are just throwing smears at you you know that's all that that's all they can do because they don't have an argument but they are somehow invested in some some very very strange ideology ideologies i you know for the life of me they, they're not logical <laughs> yeah, it can be difficult that mm. you can understand why people don't mm. speak out because you do get you become a target mm. you become a target where people just attack and they dig up dirt and they'll throw mud and hopefully it sticks but mm. why can't people just sit and have a debate just a dis look the way we're just talking yeah it's just a discussion no mm. bullshit no drama you've got your beliefs i've got my beliefs how can people not just have that discussion mm. And then I, I believe people could sort things out quicker. But everybody mm. just want greed. Everybody's want the power. Everybody's want to take over the world mm. without. I understand there's got to be things in place for the the world because you know, if it was a free for all, the world would be upside mm. down. Mm. There does there does have to be things in place. But then tribalism plays a big part. People are unhappy with their life. They need to feel part of something, mm. and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Mm -hmm. people don't know what they're talking about they're just talking talking gibberish because they see something and then they're just running with it without any backing same as mm. myself i need to be careful because we had a big audience so i need not be a hundred percent but i still need to be clued up in certain things that mm. some stats some figures to understand it now stats and figures you're reading can all be bullshit as well it could be lies mm. same as reading books it could be all bullshit that you're <laughs> reading it's, it can be difficult but just have an open mind Mm. Have an open mind. How does Christianity play a part in your decision making? 
and your beliefs. Yeah, it play, plays a very big part, you know, because um, it, particularly with the, the sort of things that are the ethical decisions. I mean, I think that's sort of a little bit that's what's different about the Heritage Party from some others, you know, what sort of tried to tackle some issues that other parties wouldn't take. They would say, oh, no, we're not going to go there. We're not going to talk about it, you know, because they're like, well, that's that's for you to, to decide for yourself. But I mean, we're, we're specifically for, you know, um, supporting the family and the traditional family, sort of marriage as a man and a woman. We're all also pro-life parties so you know i think abortion is a is a terrible thing and we would like to see you know the, the number of abortions reduced in this country you know now it's got to the state where it's just kind of been used as birth control and you know the the effect that has on you know children and and the mothers as well i mean is is awful but you know i get a lot of stick for for saying that because that's something that people get very emotional about because it is a very emotional topic but you know that's um something that you know i'm i'm definitely very very pro life because i'm christian and um yeah that that's sort of something that comes into my politics as well yeah. mm. where do you go from here brother Going to carry on with the Heritage Party as the leader of the party. So I'm, I'm going to work for, I'm almost like taking a sabbatical this year, but I'm going to spend a year just trying to make it work and build it up and make it viable and make it grow um, so that we can, we can be a challenge to, to the, the old parties, which are, you know, basically just all the same. And um, yeah, I would now, I'm, you know, I'm not in the London Assembly, which is, a, is um, you know, disappointing. That is, I think that's because you're outspoken. It may be because, yeah, I'm outspoken, definitely. But I mean, the election was, um, it was very difficult because it was, there was an unprecedented level of candidates. There were 20 candidates going for the mayor this time, whereas, you know, before there was 12. And then, you know, before that, there were only sort of eight or nine each time. So that split the vote quite a lot, you know. Um, so it, it is what it is, you know, it's very, very disappointing. So it's taken a bit of time to get over that and sort of figure out what I'm going to do next. But I'm, I'm really optimistic, you know, looking forward to the future. I want to build the Heritage Party and uh, I want to make a change in this country and restore sanity. Yeah. David, <laughs> thanks for coming on today and having really a friendly discussion. I've appreciated Cheers. that, mate. Good luck for the future. Thanks, James. Thank you. Yeah. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.